Alright, today is Tuesday, the 21st of February, and this is a recap for the stock market activities today. Now folks, I got a good one for you tonight, and what a day, what a day, what a day it was. We'll talk about all of the events that took place today, but what happened over the weekend? Any updates we need to be aware of? Oh yeah, what about the President of the United States, Joe Biden, visiting the disaster zone in Ohio? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. That's not Ohio. That's Ukraine. My bad. I, I forgot that we don't have a president anymore. Maybe the president of Mexico will visit Ohio. But in the meantime, the most important event that took place over the weekend is the re-escalation of the war in Ukraine. On one hand, here in the US, we have no voice of reason at all. We have both parties all in in the war. And the, of course, they don't know what all in means, what the end game is. And on the Russian side, it seems like they're also all in. Nobody wants to challenge the boss. God forbid they fall down a flight of stairs or they disappear in a black hole suddenly and mysteriously. And that leads us to the wall of worry. Ladies and gentlemen, once the next FOMC meeting is out of the way, this market will become increasingly geopolitical. Whether it comes from the Russia-Ukraine front or the China front, it doesn't matter. Lots of things are happening. Even on the China front, for example, Warren Buffett dumping TSM all of a sudden. What's going on there? So in the next few days, we will revisit the wall of worry. We're going to talk about the Russia-Ukraine front and the risk of reviving inflation higher if we have a re-escalation of the war. Likewise, we're going to visit the China front because we have a lot of optimism among the bullish side of the market that the reopening of China should be a catalyst for the market to go higher. But do we have other problems that could overshadow the reopening of China? We're going to discuss all of that in upcoming videos. But for now, let's talk about what happened today. It appears that the monkey rally is running out of gas. To begin with, the sentiment became extremely euphoric to the point where people have the audacity to say that the bear market is over and now we have a new bull market on hand. Even though the Fed is not done tightening the monetary policy. Even though we have no clear indication that the battle against inflation is won. You got Jim Cramer saying we're in a bull market so buy the dip. Wells Fargo already said the bear market is over. Tony Scambagamushi says that the bear market is over and now we're going to be bullish. Even the bears started to capitulate. Look at why for example at CNBC, total embarrassment, capitulating live on TV saying that the bear market is over and things got out of hand. I have never seen such a dumb ratty in my entire career and therefore I call it the monkey ratty because how could you call the bottom, how could you call the end of the bear market when we don't know whether inflation is done, whether inflation is going to go down from this point on or is it going to stick? How could you call that the bear market is over when we're not done tightening the monetary policy? Unfortunately, of course, the euphoric sentiment reached extreme dreams that we have never seen before. Yesterday, we talked about the retail mom and pop investors pouring about one and a half billion dollars per day chasing and FOMOing stocks. Unbelievable. All while the so-called smart money was actually dumping stocks. We have seen record outflows, not inflows. We have seen record inflows by the retail mom and pops into stocks, running Naruto style, head first, asking questions later. Matter of fact, don't ask questions at all. Right to the slaughter machine. While the smart money was taking the opportunity to exit the queues, to exit technology stocks. The largest outflow since September 2022 among money managers. And you wonder why this is not turning out to be what the uh, formal crowd assumed it would be? Now that was just the good news. The bad news is it's about to get worse. A lot worse. And with that lovely intro out of the way, let's move on and dig more. And here it is, in focus tonight. Poof. Gone. You're gonna lose all of your money, according to a top broker. Um, you're probably using his services right now to form a stocks, but anyways. You see, the algorithms for the stock market are now wired to track the US dollar. Every time the dollar moves higher, equities go down. Every time the dollar goes down, equities move higher. Now, why would the dollar move higher or down? The answer is, it moves higher in anticipation of more Fed rate hikes, more tightening of the monetary policy, reduction of the money supply. But it moves down in value when we get any rumors or anticipation that the Fed will uh, pivot 
or pause or loosen the monetary policy. And as of late, the dollar has been rallying higher. Based on what? Based on hotter than expectations macroeconomics data, which will prompt the Fed to raise interest rates significantly higher than we thought before. But there are two battles. There's a crisis of identity here. There is there is a dance that goes back and forth, back and forth. We see the dollar popping higher based on certain pieces of data when they come out, then the dollar moving down when other pieces of data come out. So what is the deal here? I'll explain in a minute. But for example, overnight, we got the news that uh, Madame Lagard on the ECB, she's lagging a lot, calling for 50 basis points increases in the next meeting. Translation, it means that the Federal Reserve made a major mistake of downgrading interest rate hikes from 50 basis points to 25 in the last meeting. In other words, the Fed will have to redeem itself by either doing 50 or even 75 basis points in the next meeting. Right away, the dollar is shooting up higher. We get the case of good news equals bad news because good news means hotter economy, hotter inflation, which translates to more uh, mean Fed. While uh, bad economic news equals good news for the equities market, and the reason is bad news means a slowing economy, which means slowing inflation, which means a kinder and gentler Fed. But unfortunately, the majority of the recent slew of data we've been getting suggesting that the Fed will not be kinder and gentler. For example, today we got the uh, flash PMI, the manufacturing and services PMIs, and guess what? They're rebounding higher, specifically for the services PMI, which tracks the services sector, where we have the majority of the inflation problem. And immediately upon the release of this data, the dollar shot up higher, and equities futures took a leg down. Now, this is really important from Chris Williamson. He says, February is seeing a welcome steadying of business activity after seven months of decline. Despite headwinds from higher interest rates and the cost of living squeeze. The business mode has brightened amid signs that inflation has peaked. Well, good luck with that. And recession risks have faded. Good luck with that too. At the same time, supply constraints have alleviated to the extent that delivery times for input into factories are improving at a rate not seen since 2009. Now, remember the crowd who said, oh, inflation is just a supply problem. In this channel, we said all along that inflation has always, always been a monetary phenomenon. It has nothing to do with the supply. How do you explain the fact that we're seeing rebounding inflation or we're seeing supply constraints alleviating to a rate we have not seen since 2009? I think you now know that inflation is a monetary phenomenon. Anyways, Williamson adds, however, there are some caveats to the good news. The upturn is being driven by the services sector, which in part reflects unseasonably warm weather. And although the manufacturing survey data are showing signs of improvement, the factory sector remains in contraction and focused on inventory reduction. Here's the most important part. Furthermore, the improved supply situation has taken price pressures out of manufacturing supply chains. But the survey data underscore how the upward driving force on inflation has now shifted to wages amid the tight labor market by potentially stoking concerns over wage price spiral. Accelerating service sector price growth will add to calls for higher interest rates. Listen to this which could in turn subdue the nascent expansion. So a lot of folks saying, if you listen today, oh, but what about the PMIs? The economy is doing pretty good. Maybe the soft landing is going to happen after all. Not when the underlying conditions of inflation remain alive. Among them, the law of aggregate demand, which we know it is alive and thriving. And of course, wage inflation. If that continues to go on, inflation is not going to go down. You cannot say it is a disinflation process. you genius. And on top of that, we got earnings from Home Depot, absolute disaster. So profits are declining because revenues are going down. The demand is slowing down. On the other hand, the company has to spend more and more and more on wages. So expenses rising higher, revenues going down, a lethal formula. And the end result is profits are down across the board. And you know, we've been talking about the uh, layoff optimism every time a company announces mass layoffs the stocks shoot up higher i say home depot's management could not pump their stock higher by announcing layoffs because they have no employees have you been to the stores recently nobody works there if you're shopping in home depot you might as well walk in there grab whatever you want and skip the cashier nobody's gonna say anything at all so it's kind of peculiar how they say oh we have to pay our employees more what are you talking about you got no employees but here's the problem we talked about the dollar shooting up higher every time we get 
get a hot, quote-unquote, piece of macro data. But then the dollar pulls back when we get a cold piece of data. For example, today after the dollar popped higher in reaction to the PMIs, it pulled down big time. It erased all of the gains the moment we got this piece of data. U.S. home sales continue to fall now almost for a year. That indicates that higher interest rates equals higher mortgage rates. This is slowing down home sales. This is a cold economy. This is a recessionary factor. And therefore, the dollar went down big. And another piece of data that we got today that could be considered as recessionary, how about the tsunami of layoffs? The latest being McKinsey. McKinsey is now eliminating 2,000 jobs. This is the biggest round of cuts ever in the company's history. And the question now becomes, what's up with the confusion? Why is the dollar going up and down, up and down, up and down? Why are we seeing economic data coming out hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold? What's going on here? The answer is, despite what the experts might say, we are in stagflation, ladies and gentlemen, and the stagflation phenomenon will intensify. Stagflation happens when you have a sticky inflation. On the other hand, we continue to see deteriorating underlying economic conditions. This is exactly what's going on with the economy right now. And folks, this is the worst possible outcome. We're not talking about it now. We're already in it. You know why? Because the Fed cannot look at the cold pieces of data and ignore the hot. The Fed will have to ignore the cold and concentrate on the hot because their mandate is tackling inflation down. In this channel, we've been warning over and over and over and over again that we will head into this scenario, this exact scenario we're in right now. If the Fed doesn't get ahead of inflation, if the Fed remains behind the curve, if the Fed continues to be shy, oh, we're going to follow the data. We're going to be um, nimble. Well, here's nimble for you. Now we have an economy that is weakening, yet inflation is sticking, which means the Fed will have to tighten the monetary policy even more, and they'll do so by raising interest rates even more, 5%, 5 percent 55 6 6.5%, 7 maybe beyond, while the economy continues to get worse. This is the nightmare scenario. Look at what's going on from Walmart, for example. Walmart reported earnings today. Sales were pretty good. Profits, pretty good. They can increase those prices higher, and the consumer has no other choice but to continue to pay. Otherwise, what are they going to do? Not eat? Starve to death? But even with that, Walmart now warns that even though they're selling necessities, the consumer is pulling back spending. They're reshuffling their spending into necessities, and the reason is they can no longer keep with rising prices. They can no longer keep with inflation. The consumer is losing the battle against inflation. But they continue to be zombified. They continue to spend like a drunken sailor. There is, of course, the necessities part where you have no other choice but to pay the price. And then there is the non necessity part, the splurging part where the consumer is swiping those credit cards up and down, up and down, up and down. On cars, they can no longer really afford. They're taking all the loans they cannot really afford. They're taking mortgages they cannot really afford. They're taking rents they cannot really afford. They're buying shit they cannot really afford. The combination is, Americans now have $1 trillion in credit card debt. The interest rate on this debt is rising higher and higher and higher. You put two and two together, this will end in an absolute disaster for the economy. But now you might say, hey Maverick, uh, you just told us about wage inflation as a problem. If wages are moving higher, then how come folks are resorting to using credit cards? The answer is, despite wage inflation, the rate of actual inflation in the economy is way exceeding the rate of growth in wages. Rents, sky high. Utility bills, sky high. Gas prices, sky high. Everything around us is moving higher in price. Despite what the CPLI says, our wages are moving higher higher too, but they're lagging. Not just in the US, in Japan, in Poland, in Korea, in Australia, in Germany, in the UK, in Canada, Italy, Spain, Greece, everybody. The consumer all in all is falling behind. And we have this phenomenon worldwide of consumers saying, okay, if we cannot afford to keep up with the cost of living, and I have been accustomed to a certain standard of living, of taking vacations, getting my nails done, getting my hair done, buying stupid shit I don't really need, paying subscriptions for OnlyFans. I don't want to downgrade my standard of living, so they're resorting to credit card usage. This is a global disaster in the making, folks. But they say, oh, the delinquency rate is not really that bad. The consumer still has the cushion. Um, what are you smoking here? The moment the consumer loses his or her job, and they have this ama insane amount of debt, and rates are moving higher, what do you think will happen? Delinquencies will explode. Defaults will explode. Now combine all of this together. 
We have stagflation in the economy. Prices moving higher, wages moving higher, inflation expectations moving higher, financial conditions are easing, the aggregate demand is kicking in, while we also have on the other side an economy that is collapsing. Consumer purchasing power is collapsing. The rate of economic activities only moving higher for seasonalities or due to the consumer using credit cards increasing the demand artificially, but not for legitimate organic reasons. And on top of that, the Fed is going to increase rates higher to tackle the inflation part, the inflation problem of stagflation. Again, the worst possible outcome, not just for the economy, but also for the equities market. And the reason is valuations are absolutely horrendous right now. Yet folks are stampeding to buy Tesla, to buy Nvidia, to buy Coinbase. What the hell is wrong with these people? Even the Canadian Warren Buffett says that tech stocks more overvalued now than during the dot-com bubble. Whoops. And folks, in this channel, we talked about the stages of a bear market rally. It starts by short covering for taxation reasons. A lot of shorts sitting on massive profits, they don't want to sell last year. They want to delay paying taxes. So they wait till January and then they sell. When they do so, they buy call options. This is standard procedure in short covering. Now, when they do that, the sudden surge in call options buying sends feedback to the market maker, aka the dealer, to buy these underlying stocks. We see a rally in the equities market. Then as the the rally continues to go on, it hits technical milestones such as the S&P 500 trading above the 200 days moving average. And that triggers a reaction by quant funds, who now start buying equities too. So we have three forces buying equities right now. The shorts, the dealer, and quant funds. When the market goes up 10-20% and we see stocks popping higher 20-30-40%, FOMO kicks in in the retail crowd. And they start to stampede, buying call options, buying underlying stocks, pouring $1.5 billion per day in chasing FOMO. And this is the last stage of the bear market rally. And by the way, what were they buying? Yep, the meme stocks, the AMCs, the game stops. Here's uh, Tomas Pedrofi from Interactive Brokers. Take a look. What's also up this year sharply? AMC Entertainment, GameStop. <laughs> you know where I'm going. The, the meme stocks. Meme stock trading. Back? Hey. It's it, 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 this is a terrible situation. I mean, I, I I feel so sorry for these people who are going to lose all their money. <laughs> but of course, I've been saying that for some time, and I've been wrong. But look, eventually there is no magic here. I, if, a, if a company doesn't make money, it, its stock cannot float high forever, right? So these geniuses are going to lose all their money. It did not make sense to stampede and buy AMC and GameStop back when interest rates were actually zero. Now it makes sense when interest rates are moving higher and these companies have an enormous amount of debt. They're about to go bankrupt. Wake up. And now that we have a wake up call from the recent macro data suggesting inflation is moving higher, which means the Fed will have to raise rates even higher. There is no pivot. There is no cuts. There is no pause. Bond yields are shooting up higher. The dollar is shooting up higher. Gold is crashing. Other observers of the stock market start to look around and say, hey, maybe Carvana up 100%, NVIDIA up 60%, Tesla up 70%. Maybe there's an opportunity to start shorting. And that is the first stage of the reversal of the bear market rally. Look, for example, what happened today. In the past few days, Tesla was the poster boy of the mania because the former crowd was stampeding and buying call options out of the money with weekly expiration. And the volume of calls outweighed the volume of puts and therefore Tesla exploded higher. Today, the the hottest calls contract was the 205. About 61,000 contracts traded for that particular one alone. Now contrast this with the volume for puts. The hottest contract was the 200 strike price. But look at this. About 87,000 contracts traded for this one alone. The volume at weighing the volume of calls. And therefore, the gravity becomes to the downside. What does that do? It sends feedback to the dealer, the market maker, to do a reverse gamma. Now the folks are buying puts, not calls. The dealer has to dump the shares they've been buying during the gamma squeeze. Therefore, we see Tesla down, Carvana down, Nvidia down. The hottest names all going down. And again, here's Tomas Pedrofi explaining to you the rise in short selling again. And this is indicative of the reversal of the bear market rally. Take a look. Tomas, we, we, we normally like to ask you about short positioning. How would you characterize uh, your clientele's uh, short thesis right now? Are they all in on the short side? Not all, but you're right. I mean, you we have plenty on the short side. And, uh, we, you know, we're almost, it's still, on the long side is still a little more than the short side, but not much. So, 
you know, it's, it's, it's pretty balanced. And of course, what? as the higher the stocks go, the, the shorts mm -hmm. are keep piling up. So I, I don't expect the short squeeze again <laughs> in these things. And now we get to stage number three. When the SPX, for example, loses 4,000 of support, that triggers selling by the quant funds. If the S&P loses the 200 days moving average, if it loses 3,800, that will induce more selling by the quant funds. And now we see a harsh reversal slash pullback. And the last stage comes. When the retail crowd, uh, we've been uh, bragging about the gains, brah. I'm up 70% in Tesla, 1 million percent in Carvana. Well, now the gains are down to 50%, to 30%, 20%. Still hodling, hoodling, diamond hands. Then the gains go down to 10%, 0, minus 10, minus 15, minus 20, and they capitulate and they start selling. The last in and the last out. And it's a journey that always, always ends in tears. Here's Tomas Pedrofi once again. Well, what about margin levels and, and, and leverage and that sort of thing? What does that look so like right now? So margin levels are pretty high and that... and. Uh, so look, I'm generally bearish on the market, and I've been for over a year now. I've been, of course, uh, wrong, but I think we're just postponing the inevitable. Uh, margin loans are are again picking up, and and that's not good. So I'm very worried that the higher the market goes, the the sharper it will fall, and that is going to not be pretty. So this is this is not a good situation. I'm, I keep cautioning people that they should hedge their long positions or or get out of stocks for 08 percent. And and besides, the the Fed is expected to raise to uh, the market's currently expecting the Fed to raise to five and a quarter to five and a half percent later this year. So you know, cash is a very good thing to to have, and it, it's a terrific alternative. I think. People that stay long in the market uh, are going to regret it. So I think people who have uh, uh, unrealized uh, gains, they should try to hedge with index options or index futures and, uh, uh, try or, and, and, and others who, who can liquidate should liquidate and put their money in cash. So in summary, we have an insane amount of risk taking happening in a stage where the consumer and the investors community, the trading community, should be very careful here. Instead, they're using credit cards to buy stuff they don't really need. They're using margin loans to gamble in the stock market and buy the riskiest stocks. I mean, what could go wrong here, folks? This is going to end in tears, unfortunately, of course. But hey, maybe the no landing is going to save us all. Until then, we got to move on to cover the stock market information for you. And we begin with the closing of the indices today. And uh, here we go. The Dow Industrial Average down by 697.10 points or a decline of 2.06%. The Nasdaq leading the pack to the downside this time around, losing 294.97 points or a decline of 2.5%. The S&P also down by 81.75 points or a decline of 2% even. When we look at the sectors, all down, shame on all of them, no medals given today. Yet the laggards are led by the risk-on segments, cyclicals, technology, and communication services. When it comes to the advanced decline ratio, absolutely awful today. The NYSE 13% advancing versus 87% declining. The Nasdaq on the other hand 15% advancing versus 82% declining. Now usually not always when we see such suppressed ratios we get a reaction in the very next day which means maybe a rebound at least in the futures overnight and then down we go again. On to commodities. Now the dollar was slightly higher today. It was up big then it went down because of home sales. Rebounded higher again. All in all the action was mixed across the commodities market. The most notable action is the gainers. Coffee was up over 2.5%. Most importantly, in metals, copper and platinum up by over 2.5% apiece. Now, we talked about the correlation between copper and inflation. Copper was rising year to date, indicating that inflation will also move higher. Yet the crowd said that maybe it is different this time around. Maybe copper is moving higher because of China reopening and then inflation goes down magically. And now we know the correlation stands. And by the way, 
copper continues to go higher, indicating more and more inflation in the pipeline. Now, the notable laggard in futures, of course, the formerly known as the party boy, natural gas, absolutely getting crushed, down about 9% today alone. Now, you might say, but Maverick, look at this. That's this inflation right here. Natural gas prices are getting crushed. The problem is the futures are showing one thing and then the cash prices are showing another. Prices on the ground, what we pay, you and me, and utility bills, for example, we're not seeing a crash in natural gas prices at all. Gas bills in California are now up by 300% plus. You know households in the state of California who got bills north of 500 bucks, 800, in certain cases, a thousand bucks, almost a mortgage. So be careful here looking at commodities and saying, oh, inflation is going down because we have a difference between futures and cash. Cash prices continue to move higher, not just in natural gas, but also in corn. Take a look. Despite some obvious demand weakness, the U.S. cash corn market remains strong. Accumulated U.S. corn export sales for the current marketing year are down more than 40% versus last year. The pace of U.S. ethanol production is running well below the pace needed to hit USDA projections. Despite some of these demand problems, the cash corn market in the U.S. remains strong. The Western Corn Belt and U.S. Plains have been drought-stricken. The drought resulted in drastically reduced production in the Southern Plains in particular last year. As a result, cash corn prices are trading at massive premiums to the futures market in places like Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, and Colorado. The physical corn shortage in the West has resulted in corn being moved from east to west via rail, which has resulted in relatively strong basis levels across the Corn Belt. USDA posted a substantial downward revision to their estimate for last year's U.S. corn crop in January. Basis strength may continue given physical corn deficits in the West. Moving on to the big casino, the options market, what do we see here? The volume all in all is down, indicating that maybe the gamma squeeze mania is subsiding. In other words, the retail mom and pops perhaps running out of ammo, running out of cash. They went all in buying the February 17th call options. Now that's behind us. They're still buying call options. The ratio of calls versus puts still favoring calls. The difference this time around is the market maker, the dealer who's been buying these underlying stocks, they have an insane amount of shares Tesla, Amazon, Apple, AMC, NVIDIA, Meta. And sure, the formal crowd is still buying call options, but who cares? The dealer is looking at the data and saying, okay, I see other folks now buying more put options. I see more inflows into put options, and I see the inflows into calls being reduced. You put two and two together. I, the dealer, the market maker, need to hedge in case these shares go down. It appears that the put options holders, the bears, have the better hand here. So the dealer start dumping all of these shares that they accumulated during the gamma squeeze rally when the formal crowd was buying calls and hence we see the reverse gamma and as this phenomenon continues we see more piling in and buying put options be it as a hedge or bidding against individual equities that continues to send more and more feedback to the dealer to dump more and more and more we see these massive flush downs therefore when Tomas Pedafri says the higher the market goes the bigger the pull back the bigger the flush down this is the mechanical explanation of why that happens keeping that in mind the hottest table by far was Tesla the souffle once again with about 1.3 million contracts traded today and about 54% of the volume was calls AMC at number two the name squeezed higher today another round of stupidity pumps and dumps who cares to each his own. About 900,000 contracts traded for the name today. About 54.5% of those were calls. Number 3, Apple, the big kahuna, with around 700,000 contracts traded today. About 52% of those were calls. On to the unusual activities that took place in the options market today. We begin with the ticker IWM for the Russell 2000 small caps. If we have a reversal of the monkey rally, the IWM, which led the rally higher, should lead to the downside. And here we have somebody betting on that outcome exactly. And they bought the 160 65 puts for the expiration date, March 24th, with expectations that the IWM will go down and lose more than 12% of its value by then. They paid around 65 cents a piece down her. This trade, all in all, spending around $1 million. Then what about the ticker KWeb? Now we covered the call options trade in last night's video and I said, it doesn't make sense. Why would you buy the KWeb right now when the dollar is rebanding? Does it make sense at all? So here we have somebody shorting the KWeb and they did so by buying the 27.5 puts for the expiration date, March 17th. 
17th with expectations that the name will move down and lose more than 9% of its value by then. They paid around 55 cents a piece tenor. This trade all in all spending around $600,000. And then what about the ticker HON for Honeywell? Somebody's betting against the name and they bought the 180 puts for the expiration date April 21st with expectations that Honeywell will move down and lose more than 8.5% of its value by then. They paid around 2 bucks and 30 cents a piece tenor. This trade all in all spending around $2.3 million. Now I did follow this trade and the reason is it is quite unusual. Maybe somebody knows something about earnings, who knows. And then we have the ticker PFE for Pfizer. Somebody's buying the dip here. I've been buying the dip and I think names like Pfizer will start to outperform now. Anyhow, somebody bought the 47 and a half calls for the expiration date, April 21, with expectations the PFE will move higher and gain more than 11% by the expiration date. They paid around 23 cents a piece to enter. This trade all in all spending around $200,000. Last but not least, what about the ticker IOT for a software company called Sam Sarah? Cute couple. Anyways, the name is up big year to date, but somebody is fading the rip and they bought the 15 puts for the expiration date March 17th with expectations the name will move down and lose more than 7.5% of its value by then. They paid around one buck a piece tenor. This trade all in all spending around $600,000. On to the heat map. What do we see here? A bloodbath across the board with exception of what? The value cohort. We're talking about Big Pharma, not all of them. J&J, &J, Pfizer were down, but AbV, NVO, AZN, AstraZeneca were all up. And by the way, Amgen was up big on Friday. J&J &J was up. Pfizer was up. So we're seeing some buying of the dip here in the big pharmaceuticals. Likewise, the defense contractors, Lockheed, Northrop, outperforming today. The Maverick kind of names outperforming today. Oil and gas, not all of them, not Exxon, not Chevron, but names such as Valera, VLO, which which we've been long for a long time now. In metals, we have copper, FCX, another name, the Maverick is long, Freeport McMoran, that's not performing. And then we have the consumer staples, not all of them, but the food companies such as GIS, General Mills, another name that I'm long, popping big. I've been saying this all along, folks. This is not new. I've been saying the monkey rally in technology and high beta, that is a distraction. And the dumping of the high quality names such as GIS, Conegra, the big pharmaceuticals, the defense contract, Contractors. This is where the opportunity resides as an investor. When the Fed is raising rates, you want to move to value. They gave you the opportunity in the silver platter. Did you take it or not? Are you taking it or not? Lockheed Martin, back to the highs. The pharmaceutical names are recovering. GIS, popping big today, about 5% or so. And these names will continue to outperform. We will see a rotation out of the stupidity mania into value stocks again. And by the way, why was uh, General Mills up big today? The answer is they're upgrading the forecast. They're going to make more profits now. Which company in the tech cohort coming out and saying, hey folks, we're going to revise our top and bottom lines up. You're not seeing that. You're seeing companies cutting their earnings forecast, cutting their revenue forecast, warning about a slowdown. Not in GIS, baby. They're pumping higher. Not in Lockheed. More war, more uh, Ukraine stuff, money laundering. North Korea, Kim Jong-un. That means more and more money for Lockheed. Anyhow, one of the most important names I talked about today in the morning brief, I give my members a list of names that I'm watching in the morning. Leading indicators. We talked about Carvana. We talked about Tesla. We talked about NVIDIA. We talked about Bitcoin. We're looking for targets. We're looking for U-turns in the pops, indicating that the sentiment is changing. That means you double down in the puts. You double down, betting that the rally is going to reverse. One of those leading indicators was Meta. Why Meta? Because we got the stupid news that Meta is now charging for the blue check mark, imitating Elon Musk Twitter. Now that works in Twitter. I don't see why I would pay 12 bucks a month or whatever they're charging to get verified on Facebook. To begin with, I haven't logged in my account for about 10 years now. But this is exactly the kind of news that if we are in a hype, mania, bubble, stupidity, form, or whatever, will pop the stock significantly higher. But if it fades right away, what does that say? It indicates that the sentiment is changing. What did we get in the morning? Meta, based on this news, was up about 1.5% in the morning, and it caught a bit right away. The former crowd stampeding, heads first, Naruto style, not asking questions, asking questions later, maybe not asking questions at all. And then we see the U-turn. Why? Because the dealer is dumping, because the holders sitting on profits are dumping the rational. 
actors in the market are dumping. And that is a leading indicator that this mania, this hype is coming to an end if it hasn't ended already. On to the heat map for the ETFs. What do we see here? A bloodbath across the board, the exception being the inverse indices. Besides that, everything is down. Value down, but growth down more. US ETFs down, internationals down. Now the question becomes, what are they going to buy? Are they going to buy and rotate into the ad performers today, be it the XLP, consumer staples, or energy, the XLE? That remains to be seen. We have to watch for it because every time we get a massive sell-off like this, indiscriminate, you got to Remember, not everything deserved to be sold. And the question becomes, where will money rotate to? Money's coming out of chips, that's for sure. Money's coming out of the hype names, Tesla, RKK, technology, retail stores. The XRT is down almost 5% for the day. Where will the money rotate to? Gotta watch for that. Anyways, let's do some charts and then wrap it up. We have the SPY, the S&P 500, 30 minutes. What do we see here? We talked about a reverse ABC pattern. It did not make it quite to closing the gap at 408 33. Now the argument becomes, what about the gaps above? Folks, there is a reason why I use the continuous contract when we look at the daily chart. Because gaps can be distracting. They say gaps above always fill. Sure, because all in all, the market goes higher over time. So duh. But in the meantime, are we going to close the gaps above tomorrow, this week, this month, or 10 years from now? Why would I be so obsessed about the gaps above and not look at the action that we have right now? Because what we do have is a C leg that took us all the way down to 398. Now the chart is becoming oversold. Look at the RSI, look at the MACD indicator. That doesn't mean it has to rebound right away. It could rebound in the morning, but if the downward shift and momentum continues, then we see a gap and crap right away. What we could see also is a move all the way down exactly to 398. 98 perhaps a little below that and then the charts become really really oversold and we see a rebound so my hunch is watch 398 if we get all the way down there and we see a rebound a legitimate one by legitimate we mean a rebound a retest of 398 and then a move higher again then you know you should book your profits from the puts and the short bets and then wait for a reversal add them back on. So long as the dollar continues to go higher, so long as yields continue to go higher, so long as the VIX continues to go higher. What about the daily chart for the continuous contract for the S&P? Number one, the momentum indicators are now in negative divergence. They're moving down rapidly, be it the RSI, be it the MACD indicator. Number two, volume is moving higher. That's not a good sign for the bulls, good sign for the bears. Number three, we lost 4,037. So now we have to look down at 3,960. If that is lost to support, no harm done. No reversal yet. However, if 3,855 is lost to support, then we're talking. We have a reversal and perhaps it will lead us all the way down to 3,600 if not making a lower low. Cash index SPX. This is what I uh, released on Friday. I said thoughts. We have a channel that looks like a megaphone with lower highs and lower lows. The question becomes, are we going to go down to the lows, which by the way coincides with 4,000, an important number? And here's the answer. We did get down all the way to the penny caught a rebound that didn't hold and now we're down to 4,000 we closed below 4,000 not a good look for the SPX here and the danger becomes if we look at the weekly chart 4,000 is an important line but the confirmation would be a weekly closing below the last shoulder in the reverse head and shoulder formation because if that is the case then we know for sure that the gap above 4,228 and a half will not be filled and that would be really ominous that maybe the gap will not be filled for years to come and down we go to make a lower low which will take us all the way to the trend line that goes all the way back to 2009 that will be a loss from this point on worth about 23 percent or so what about the cues 30 minutes what do we see here again a gap down melt down all the way till the end of the day the gaps above were not filled at least for now the rsi is in negative divergence it is at oversold territory but we have a closing below 294.33 an important number we have now erased the entirety of the fomc rally and this was logical folks we talked about the dixie erasing the losses in the fomc or since the fomc i should say bonds doing the same gold doing the same it was just a matter of time for equities to get the memo now we have support all the way down at 290 if we go all the way down in one shot to 290 and the rsi becomes really really oversold i'm gonna book profits from the short bets maybe play a rebound for a day or two and then short again depending on what depending on whether the dollar is still trading higher number one number two whether bond yields are 
still moving higher. Number three, whether the VIX is moving higher or not. On to the daily chart for the continuous contract for the Qs. What do we see here? Again, we have the megaphone pattern in a negative channel with lower lows and lower highs. If we go down all the way to the lower end of the channel, that will coincide with about 12,000. That should be support be it soft support because what we know for now is the RSI is in negative divergence so is the MACD indicator and it is accelerating showing negative momentum slash bearish momentum the volume continues to rise indicating that the bears are now in charge the sellers are now in charge not a good look for the bulls for now they need to catch support and show a reversal signal and then we're talking absent of that the bears are now in command the IWM 30 minutes chart what do we see here last night we talked about the possibility of a bear flag pattern yes the IWM been holding at 191 and a half of support over and over and over and over again but if we have risk off versus risk on the iwm will lead the way to the downside so we have a gap down and the chart lost 191 and a half not only that but it also lost 188 major bearish signal now if we go down all the way in one shot to 183 which happens to be the next support and i see the rsi really really oversold then i'm gonna cover taking profits from the short bets and then maybe play the rebound see where it leads us and then look at the dollar, look at the VIX, look at bond yields. If they're still going higher, we short again. And here it is, the Dixie, the dollar index. Again, we're waiting, waiting for the big pop. The setup is bullish. We're waiting for the spark and the big pop higher, which should take us all the way at around 106. If that is the case, then gold will lose the important support 1842 and then we look down at support 1763 we'll look at crude oil brent keeping the trend line for now but boy is it losing momentum or not if it does not the end of the world we're looking for 77 as support if 77 as support is lost then we have a problem with oil here what about the daily chart for the 10-year yield it is moving higher we talked about 3.8 in the bag it is in the bag now it is support it has been tested not once but twice we're now looking at four percent and four percent should be a good ceiling at least for now maybe for a pullback depending on the slew of the macro data but most importantly we have to look at the two-year note the auction today was not so good indicating no demand therefore prices go down yields go higher the two-year popped significantly higher we're now looking for 5.24 as the next resistance and again if that is the case it has forget about it, it has it must come with a reckoning in the queues, the tech cohort, the high beta names. They have to go to lows of November. Maybe not all of them, but the majority of them. What about the TLT daily chart? What do we see here? All the way down to around 100. We'll see how that's going to hold if the 10 year yield goes all the way to four. And the assumption is the TLT will break 100 as support. What about the VIX? Four hours chart. We talked about the cup and handle formation. It is playing out. We have a gap up. Really strong momentum for the VIX, but it is going to top at some point. Could it be another pop higher all the way to 24? point 29 with that comes the spy and the queues moving down to the next support and that means the vix is going to start to move down in a pullback spy queues will rebound and therefore you take your profits from the short bets the puts maybe play a rebound or not just step aside wait for the signal that the rebound is over and then short again apple the big kahuna 30 minutes what do we see here a lot of gaps above but who cares for now at some point we're going to close them could that happen this week this month this year or 10 years from now who knows so i'm not going to be obsessed with the gaps above what i'm looking at right now is the loss of support of 150 this is significant and it makes the target at 145 the gap will be closed we talked about the queues erasing the entirety of the fomc rally apple is the laggard now and it needs to move down all the way to 145 to erase the entirety of the post fomc rally and again a reminder we talked about this in last night's video a daily chart of apple every single time every single time the macd indicator was this elevated and it was moving down from bullish momentum to negative momentum we have seen a topping formation in apple is it happening again you gotta assume that this is the case tesla the souffle 30 minutes chart what do we see here it could not close above 200 this is a loss for the culties a loss for the former crowd and it says that the gamma squeeze perhaps coming to an end on top of that the trend line is now broken we have to look down at 194.55 as the next support but here's the problem similar to apple every single time the macd 
was reading at this elevated level. It was curling down, indicating the end of bullish momentum and the start of a new bearish momentum. We saw a topping formation in Tesla. And then big leg downs, big corrections followed. You gotta assume that this will be the case again. Bitcoin tulips, a daily chart. What do we see here? This pop doesn't smell right. It doesn't pass the smell test, at least for me. If we go down and we lose 23,189 of support, then the rally's over. And the chart will go all the way down to 20,593.34. Now, the negative divergence on the RSI is suggesting that this will be the outcome. The equities market is now catching up with bonds, with gold, with the dollar, with energy, with commodities. And the tulip market is the outlier right now. In my opinion, it is just a matter of time before Bitcoin catches up with what's going on and move down too. Now, what about some bonus charts? And we begin with the ticker ARKKKKK for Tesla Witch Cathy Wood. Now, today is said that looks like Mama Cathy is going down. We have a consolidation pattern. If it is broken to the downside, then we have to look down at 39.2 as support. If that's broken, we will see acceleration of selling that will take us perhaps all the way down to 35, and that will be a loss of about 11% from this point on at a minimum. Now, the consolidation pattern is broken. We're waiting for 39.20 to be broken, and then we got a confirmation. And then we talked about shorting the uh, home builders and home depot a while ago because yields are moving higher. And I floated the name DHI DR Horton. Now, here's what's going on. This is a weekly chart for the name. It almost got back to the highs in the insanity mania rally. But are we seeing perhaps a head and shoulder formation? Are we seeing a loss of momentum in the RSI and the MACD indicators? If that is the case, then we have a trend line. Should it be broken, then we go down all the way to the next trend line, and that would be a loss of about 17%. So I am shorting the name, and if the trend line is broken, I'm going to be doubling down. And since we're talking about bond yields moving higher, another name you should be shorting, and we've been shorting in this channel, is HD Home Depot. Now, let's revisit what I said about two weeks ago and then come back and see what's going on. This chart for HD Home Depot, this is a monthly chart, a long-term one. Uh, my forecast is we have a reverse ABC pattern on hand. This is confirmed by the weakness in the RSI and the MACD. And the assumption is if this plays out, we go down all the way to the trend line in HD that has been going on since at least 2015. And here's the update. It appears that the reverse head and shoulder formation is playing out. Now, mind you, this is a monthly chart, so it's going to take a long, long time to play out. But the assumption should be we're going to go down to the trend line. This is an easy short. No debates. No questions allowed. Lastly, moving on to the conclusion of this video, what do we have on the economic calendar tomorrow? We have the FOMC minutes. This is a lagging indicator. Who cares what Jerome Powell said? This inflation 11 times. What a fool. And then we have another Fed zombie from New York, the man formerly in known as the King of Doves, John Williams. He is still a dove, by the way, but he has to put on the hawk suit and play along. You know the deal. Anyhow, folks, this is all I got for you for tonight. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And I will talk to you again tomorrow. Good night. Yeah. Hey Jack, you're a stockbroker, right? Mm. Any changes in the market coming? It's always f***ing changing, Tony. That's what keeps us coming back. <laughs> I left you all alone ago. Don't even think I know you And you, you don't know who I am You never had a chance to Cause I was always searching in I was never there I was busy Small